Hello, I'm Dr. Benjamin Strong, the Chief Medical Officer of Virtual Radiologic, or VRAD. I started my career with an internal medicine residency and followed that with three years of work as an emergency physician. I then returned to training for a radiology residency and a fellowship in body and MSK MRI. In the course of my over 20 years in radiology, I have worked as a private practice radiologist, an academic radiologist, and for the last 17 years as a teleradiologist for VRAD. I have been the chief medical officer there for eight years and am licensed to practice in all 50 states. Neuroradiology trauma. So this one, I broke into two groups of 12. We're going to have 12 intracranial hemorrhage cases and then 12 of face and spine trauma. Okay, first one is a classic epidural hemorrhage. You can see it here in the floor of the middle cranial fossa, hyperdense, lens shaped. As we go higher up, you can see the medial displacement of the uncus. And you can see that pressing ever so slightly on the left aspect of the brainstem and the distortion of that supracellar cistern. One cut higher, you can see again the medial displacement of the uncus, but also note the distortion of the inferior horn. That can be extremely helpful in spotting epidural hemorrhage. I have uh, actually been tuned to a small epidural more than once by spotting the elevation, the medial displacement, and the distortion of that left inferior horn. So there it is, it's extending up from the floor. There's the medial displacement of the uncus, and there is that inferior horn. You can see that it's elevated and distorted as well as medially displaced. There's the uncus, again, that inferior horn. And here, of course, is the skull fracture, almost always present in an epidural hematoma, but also almost always invisible. So don't, uh, don't be discouraged if you don't spot those. Uh, they're almost certainly there. This was quite a case. I remember very well, this uh, was a young kid, 13 or 14 years old, who was playing third base and was hit by a line drive. And if any of you have played baseball, you may be wondering, how can you be hit in the side of the head with a line drive? Surely you'd be hit between the eyes because you'd see it coming. Well, my conclusion is this guy played baseball like I did, and he was looking at everything but the batter and the action on the diamond. Uh, so he got hit in the side of the head and never saw it coming. When I called this one in, uh, the on-site ER doctor was extremely nervous because they were kind of in the middle of nowhere. They were in North Dakota, and this was going to require an emergent transfer. And if this patient uh, started doing poorly, he was going to have to drill him. And uh, I'll tell you, when I was an ER doctor, I lived in constant fear of that. That was my single greatest fear uh, because I just, you know, I was an internal medicine doctor. I was I thought never going to be capable of doing that. So fortunately, I made it through my three years of ER uh, without having to do that. This guy was incredibly nervous, but he ultimately uh, stepped up and did have to drill this kid, and uh, he did very well. So uh, a treatment success. All right, our next one. This is another kind of epidural. This one's on the anterior pole of the temporal lobe. Now this is entirely different. This is a venous collection. These actually do very well. Most of these are just uh, managed expectantly, just watched and monitored, and they usually resolve with no issues. Uh, these venous pole hematomas are related to tearing of the uh, spinoparietal sinus. There's a very specific anatomic source for this. This patient didn't get off that easily, though. He also has a skull fracture and a classic epidural uh, higher up. Now, this is obviously an arterial one related to middle meningeal artery tearing. Uh, the other thing I would point out is the hypodensity within this lesion, right? You can see clearly the dense blood, but there's also a component that's relatively hypodense. 
this is perhaps not the best example of this, but certainly it's worth noting. That is the appearance of a hyperacute epidural hematoma, right? You see that mix of uh, density and hypodensity in a subdural, you're going to think, oh, this is non-acute or stuttering, right? That there are older components in this. Not so with these epidurals. Uh, they can look highly variegated. They can practically look like there are swirling elements of density and hypodensity. Uh, in the case of an arterial epidural, that does not mean it's not acute. So again, he's got both. There is the venous epidural on the temporal pole. And now the arterial with that heterogeneity suggesting a hyperacute time course. Let's look at that one more time. Again, that's the sphenoparietal sinus torn to give you that venous hematoma. And of course, the middle meningeal to give us this one. There is the skull fracture. I actually don't think we need to belabor that. This one is uh, highly visible. In fact, it's visible in practically every cut, so not one you'd be likely to miss. So that again, a combined arterial and venous epidural, just basically made from my teaching file. All right, this one, another venous epidural, but we'll start here with these hypodensities in the frontal region. You can see those actually do involve the cortex as well as white matter, and these are consistent with uh, frontal lobe contusions, certainly a common place to get those. And here, crossing the midline. What? Crossing the midline? Yes, uh, epidurals typically don't cross sutures um, or the midline, but the exception to that, of course, is these frontal ones where the arrangement of the dura and sinuses are such that it does allow venous epidurals to cross the midline in the front. So here are those contused frontal lobes and that epidural crossing the midline. Still somewhat lens shaped though. Has a little bit of a turgid look to it. The fracture on this one is great. It actually tracks up through the right frontal sinus and ends up diastasing the sagittal suture. So. Watch it there, coming up through the sinus, and ultimately passing into the sagittal suture and splitting it wide there. See how anteriorly it's just a little wider than posteriorly. Let's watch that one more time. And that, of course, is going through the superior sagittal sinus and causing that venous hematoma. And, of course, you'll get those bridging the transverse sinus as well. All right, let's look at this extraaxial hemorrhage. There is extraaxial density here. In fact, when you see this on the uh, cine, you'll see that it's actually probably mixed intraaxial and extraaxial density. When you just can't separate out, is this cortical petechia? Is this subdural hemorrhage? Is it subarachnoid hemorrhage? Our director of the QA committee, uh, Julie Shaffrey, she has this line. She says, mixed intra and extraaxial hemorrhage you're covered for everything. And uh, if there's one thing we know about Julie Shaffrey, it's she's always right. And it's uh, that kind of reporting, I think, that gets her there. You can see those stipple densities suggesting hemorrhagic contusion, as well as the more peripheral stuff that looks to be a mix of subarachnoid and subdural. But that's not actually why I chose this case. What really struck me here is the soft tissue gas on the opposite side. So this is most likely a contra coup injury right, related to a fall on a temporal bone fracture. So here is the fracture. Now, when you read about these, right, they describe temporal bone fractures as longitudinal along this axis or transverse. Of course, almost every T-bone fracture I've seen is oblique. I mean, look at that fracture line. It's almost perfectly 45 degrees from longitudinal or transverse. But 
This one is behaving like a longitudinal. The longitudinals are the more common of those fractures. And I always remember, they are what affect the conduction portion of hearing, uh, whereas the transverse fractures typically damage nerves, right? So vestibular cochlear nerve or facial nerve are damaged by the transverse ones, whereas the longitudinal are associated with ossicular disruption and tempor uh, tympanic membrane rupture. Right, so the conductive elements of hearing. That's pretty impressive though. You can compare to the other side, you can see a perfect malleus sitting on an incus on the opposite side. And here, they're separated by a good millimeter with all kinds of space in between. So there's the gas in the soft tissues right at the skull base, telling you to go look for that temporal bone fracture. You can really appreciate the separated ossicles there. Very nice. Right? In fact, that's not enough. I had to do a blow up view, but you can definitely see, right? You've got an ice cream cone with a scoop of ice cream on it on the right side, and on the left, uh, it's falling right off the cone there. So that's a mixed intra and extraaxial hemorrhage with a temporal bone fracture and conductive hearing loss. Well, this is a sad case because of course it is a child. And um, this is a multifocal subdural hemorrhage that comes from both choking and shaking. So that tentorium, it can be tricky, as I've mentioned before. It can be pretty tough to call it dense, but here the asymmetry just hands you that diagnosis. Here you can see there is density in the extraaxial region, but there's also a vague density coating both frontal lobes. It suggests uh, multiple ages of hemorrhage have been accumulating. Also note the cytotoxic edema. It can be a tough call in a kid, but these patches are actually everywhere. They're in his frontal lobes, uh, as well as in his occipitals and even parietal lobes. And that is a typical kind of watershed distribution of ischemia. Look at how extensive it is up here higher. Uh, that is typical of choking. So you can see there's a little parafalcine density as well, another typical spot. And again, those cortical hypodensities pretty much everywhere there's more infarcted brain than not here so i did like this case in that it shows you so many of the classic spots that you can acquire or collect subdural hemorrhage right so we've got it against the tent over the convexities and along the falcs so there's that asymmetric tentorial density you can see of course these cytotoxic regions and the mixed density extraaxial collections suggesting varied ages. Lastly, parafalcine. So pretty much all the classic spots that you get subdural hemorrhage. And again, the cortical hypodensities really strongly suggestive of strangling while the subdural hemorrhage is more suggestive of shaking. 